Hey, it's Brewbird. Last time we talked about how to recruit people into a sensory panel. But how do we conduct a sensory panel and make sure everyone follows good sensory panel practices? I mean, what are good sensory panel practices anyway? And why are they so important? Let's play a quick game to find out. So I'd like everyone without scrolling down to the comment section to pick a number between one and 10. Okay, have you got it? So I'm pretty sure most of you didn't choose number one because well, that's on the extreme end of the spectrum. Same with the number 10. Those numbers probably didn't seem random enough for you to choose. There's a slightly higher chance that you pick two or nine and an even higher chance that you chose three or eight. I think you get the picture. As we move closer to the center of the group of numbers, the higher the likelihood that you chose that number. But wait a minute, I told you to pick a random number. So wouldn't you expect every number to have the same chance of being chosen? Well, no, because people aren't really good at being random. I once took a statistics class in university and the professor did the same experiment with us. I think there were about a hundred or so people in the classroom and we were all asked to pick a number between one and 10. And the majority of people ended up choosing numbers that were in the middle. If you were to do this experiment with even more people, say a million people, and put all the data into a chart and then make a graph from it, I think it would probably look like a bell curve. So you can see here on the bottom, all the numbers on the X axis. And on the Y axis, the number of people who chose that number. This experiment shows that we all have biases that we aren't aware of. So that's why when we run a sensory panel, we want to try our best to eliminate these biases through following good sensory practices. We can do this by minimizing any variables in our environment, in our samples, and in the test procedure itself. Ways we can control the environment are to make sure that the testing room has a constant temperature, around 22 to 24 degrees Celsius and humidity. We can have a dedicated enclosed space for holding our sensory panels, and we might even have colored lights in the room. The colored lights will stop panelists from being able to clearly distinguish the color of the samples. Color can lead to biases. For example, if a beer is darker in color, you might assume it has a heavier flavor than something that is lighter in color. We can control the product by making sure we give everybody the exact same amount in the exact same type of container. Typically, you want to avoid serving samples in wood, since wood is porous and can absorb water and oil. The best materials to store and prepare and serve in are stainless steel, glass, or glazed china. Plastic can be used too, but only if the samples are held in it for less than 10 minutes. We're really trying to minimize any differences in our sensory evaluation tests and remove anything that we might think will be a problem so that there's no bias in our panelists. I actually once heard a story where someone was on a tasting panel at a beer competition and they were sampling a whole bunch of different beers. And one of the panelists kept thinking, oh, so many of these beers smell woody and he didn't know why. And then he realized that he was using a wooden pencil to take notes about all the different samples. And this wooden pencil was imparting some aromas onto his fingers. And when he went to drink all the samples, he was just smelling the wood from the pencil that he was using. This brings up another important point. When you are having your panelists write down notes during the sensory evaluation session, Everybody should be using a mechanical pencil or a pen to avoid this very problem. Here's a list of other good panelist behaviors. They should be fragrance neutral. They should participate regularly. They should follow our directions and they should take our tasting sessions seriously. As well, they should be resting and cleaning their palates between samples with water and some unsalted crackers. Here's a list of bad panelist behaviors. Bad panelists will eat, drink, or smoke 30 minutes before the sensory evaluation. They talk or comment during the evaluation. 
and that's bad because we don't want the opinion of one panelist to influence the entire group, which is why everyone needs to be quiet during the sensory evaluation. Bad panelists will also take part in the sessions even when they have a cold. We never want someone who has a cold to take part in our session because their ability to taste and smell aromas are compromised. We don't want panelists to share samples and we definitely don't want panelists to wear perfume or cologne because that will impact how they're tasting and smelling the products. Again, when we're serving our samples, we want to make sure we offer water to rinse the mouth between samples. We should also be offering unsalted crackers or bread or celery to help cleanse the palate as well. Going back to how we're presenting the samples, we'll want to coat our samples so that our panelists don't know what we're giving them. You might be tempted to code your samples as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But you should avoid coding your samples with single digit or double digit numbers and letters. Tasters might subconsciously choose sample 1 because number 1 is associated with first place or the best. Instead, we should give our samples a random three-digit number code, like 345 or 521, something like that. The number of samples we present to the panelist is also important too. If you give a panelist too many samples, then they'll get mental fatigue and it will be difficult for them to make good decisions during the test. Generally, if you're doing beers, it's best to have a maximum of six to eight samples. If you're tasting things that have a lot of flavor, like smoked meats and cheeses, you should do one to two samples per evaluation. However, if you aren't tasting the samples and are just having your panelists visually inspect them, you can have up to 20 to 30 samples at a time. Other things we want to try and keep the same are the serving temperature of our product. For a sensory evaluation of beer, we want the temperature to be 10 to 12 degrees Celsius, which is slightly warmer than normal serving temperatures. And this is so we can really get a fuller aroma of the beer. Ideally, we want to serve the beer in dark glasses in a room with red light so that we can't tell the color of the beer, unless that's something we want the panelists to assess. And we want to make sure we're pouring out the samples of beer in the same way to avoid foam differences and volume differences in our samples. We can see that good sensory panel practices are all about removing anything that might bias a panelist's opinion. We want to keep everything as neutral as possible. Next time, we're going to discuss the different types of sensory evaluation tests that exist and in which situations we'd want to use each kind of test. In the meantime, please support the channel by giving this video a thumbs up, leaving a comment down below, and hitting that subscribe button for more distilling, drinks, and brewing videos. This is Brewbird, sending good vibes your way. I'll see you next time.